Hi, welcome. I'm Mary Thoreau. I'm with the Independent Institute of Oakland, California, and we produced uh, Dr. Vetter's new book called Restoring the Promise. Uh, Dr. Vetter is a senior fellow with the Independent Institute, and he's also Professor Emer Emeritus at uh, Ohio University. He's been called the leading economist of higher education in America, and Restoring the Promise has been getting a lot of attention. Um, he's been speaking widely around the country, has been doing a lot of media. Um, it's received rave reviews in everything from the Claremont Review of Books to the Wall Street Journal. Um, the Wall Street Journal called him the Cassandra of American colleges and universities. Uh, we're very pleased to have him be able to be here with us. Uh, earlier this year, Dr. Vetter met with Secretary DeVos to discuss his findings and recommendations for higher education, and he was subsequently invited to the signing ceremony of Trump's executive order on freedom of expression. So he uh, has a lot of great information to share with us. On your seats, there's a summary of the book, and inside the summary you'll see a reading list, and it has um, books and other material called every, What Every Student Should Know in Liberty, on Liberty, and arranged grouped by subjects you might be interested in. I recommend you look at that. Um, following uh, Dr. Vetter's talk, he will be answering questions, so feel free to keep get, be ready with your questions. Thank you very much, and without further ado, Richard Vetter. Thank you, Mary. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, most young Americans know that America's colleges and universities are too expensive, often do not offer terribly useful or even entertaining learning outcomes, and sometimes repress the free expression of ideas critical to uh, expanding human uh, understanding. Thank you, Mary. I can see the audience now. And, uh, and sometimes they do not even get good jobs after graduation. A three-word executive summary of my remarks might be, American universities suck, but more accurately I would say American uh, colleges sometimes suck, but they can be improved and become great again. You might be asking why Charlie Kirk would allow an old dude approximately four times the age of the uh, average age of the people in the audience, why they would let me speak. I have been teaching for over a half a century, including this semester, uh, ending just last week. I've taught about 12,000 college students and been on literally hundreds of campuses. Uh, while my field is uh, economic history, I spent the last two decades examining higher ed, uh, in, uh, culminating in the book that uh, Mary Thoreau just mentioned, Restoring the Promise. I attended an expensive, selective private university, Northwestern. My tuition my freshman year was $795. In today's dollars, that's slightly less than $7,000 a year. In the year just ending, Northwestern's undergraduate tuition was $56,232 a year, about eight times as much after correcting for inflation. It took Americans 140 days uh, in 1958 to make enough money to pay the Northwestern tuition. Now it takes 377 days for the average American to earn enough money uh, to make that tuition payment. Think about it. Almost everything you buy has gotten cheaper and easier to pay for. An airplane ticket, buying a nice TV, purchasing a loaf of bread, almost all things have gotten less burdensome over time with economic growth, and product quality has improved. The old TV sets were black and white, the new ones are not only the color, the bigger screens, better resolution, everything's gotten better. Yet the cost of going to college has become harder to finance, absorbing vastly more of our income. And I doubt that the quality improvement that you've seen in many other goods holds for colleges and universities. 
And you might say my tuition example is distorted because I picked on an expensive private school. So let's take an institution where I currently teach at, Ohio University, mid-quality, typical state school. When I started teaching there in 1965, when the average person in the audience was minus 35 years old, uh, the tuition was 450 bucks a year. It took an average American 59 days to pay that tuition fee. Today, the fee is 12,000 a year uh, for in-state students. It takes about 80 days to, of income to pay that fee, considerably more than the 60s. Everything you go to in America, uh, everywhere you go in America, the burden of financing college has risen substantially over time. Well, the price of almost everything else has fallen relative to your income. But here is what is really interesting. College costs didn't always rise faster than our incomes. As the First slide uh, shows uh, between 1840 and 1978, tuition fees rose annually with the rate of inflation about 1% more. I'll use my fingers too. This I call West Virginia PowerPoint. I use my fingers. 1% more uh, than uh, the rate of inflation between 1840 and 78. But our incomes were rising faster, about 2% a year. That meant that the actual financial burden of college was gradually declining over time. It explains why in, say, 1975, there were a lot more kids in co uh, college than in 1875. Only in the last 40 years have college costs become less affordable. Why is that? The reason is simple. The federal government has gone big time into the business of financing college education. Before the 1970s, more persons, uh, de most persons depended on their families, accumulated savings, uh, or private financial institutions to finance college. Now the federal government holds over one and a half trillion dollars of student loan debt. As schools became aware that students could borrow a lot of money to meet college costs, they started aggressively raising their fees. Instead of going up 1% a year more than the inflation rate, they now go up about 3% more than the inflation rate. Now, if fees after 1978 had gone up at the same rate uh, relative to inflation they were before 1978, uh, today, they would be about 45% lower than they uh, actually are. Uh, uh, for example, the University of Georgia now charges students $12,000, $12,080 in-state tuition. They would instead be charging $5,400 if the rates of tuition fees had gone up like they used to. Princeton says charging almost $52,000 would be charging 23,000. The student loan crisis would not exist because students would be able to cover most of their costs using traditional methods of financing, prior savings, family contributions, and some moderate amount of private borrowing, often within the family. The real scandal, though, is where the additional tuition monies are going where the extra money has gone from the higher fees. As this slide shows, uh, at one time, a large majority of the money university spends went for the basics, instruction and research. Now a significant majority goes for other things. A large part has gone to finance things with no direct relationship to learning including a massive administrative bureaucracy. Most universities now have more bureaucrats than teachers. Some additional money, no offense, Dean, we have one of those bureaucrats sitting right here. Nice, but he's a nice one. Uh, we do need deans. Uh, most universities now have more bureaucrats than teachers. 
Some additional money has gone to allow, allow lower teaching loads for faculty so they can write more papers that virtually no one reads for obscure journals on topics of dubious social importance. We devote huge resources to help faculty members get tenure. An employment practice ab uh, absence uh, uh, in virtually every other occupation. Some increased funds have also gone to fund higher salaries, especially for senior administrators and a few academic superstars. There's a massive con game going on here where adults in power are using adolescents and young adults as pawns. The means to redistribute income away from the kids and their parents to themselves. It's a financial form of child molestation. The trusted, mature adults are using kids and education as a vehicle to make life better for themselves. In academia, it reaches its most extreme form in commercially popular forms of intercollegiate athletics, where some superstar football and basketball players disproportionately African-American, I might add, are paid a trivial portion of what they add to the university's revenue, most of the surplus going to fund their coaches with their multi-million dollar salaries. All of this is an example of the law of unintended consequences. Early advocates of federal student financial assistance sincerely wanted to help persons of modest means attend college. What happened instead is that the price of education rose for all, so a smaller percentage of kids graduating from college today come from the bottom quarter of the income distribution than was true in 1970, when the federal student uh, uh, lending was in its infancy. American stu college students today and their families are victims of government failure at its worst. Moving on, the evidence is fairly clear that college students today are learning less than the ones did two generations ago. Although colleges are in the business of acquiring and disseminating knowledge, they do surprisingly little gathering and spreading information about their own performance. Perhaps not surprising considering much evidence shows that learning is modest. Evidence from the civic literacy test administered by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute shows that seniors at major American universities have little more knowledge of basic facts concerning our history, our political institution, economic principles than do freshmen. One reason Americans are less unified than ever is high schools and universities downplay America's extraordinary founding and its impact on our economic and cultural advance. We're losing knowledge of our shared identity, knowledge which is the glue binding Americans together with a common identity, including a shared love of our truly exceptional nation. Uh, an extraordinary study of critical thinking skills in American University by Richard Arum and Jofia Arokska utilizing the respected collegiate learning assessment showed little improvement in writing or critical thinking as college life progresses. Critical reasoning skills of seniors, uh, not to mention their aptitude in writing, is little more than a freshman. None of this, though, is terribly surprising. Since the time you survey, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that the typical American college student spends 27 hours a week on all academic endeavors, down from 40 hours weekly in the middle of the last century. Uh, meanwhile, as the slide shows here, average grades in the 1950s uh, was typically a B minus or C plus, but here, as this shows, uh, it's now between a B and a B plus. The average GPA at Brown is 3.75, better than an A minus at Brown University. Why bother to study? Much if you're going to get a high grade anyway. One recent study estimated 37% of high school graduates 
that were tested were college ready. Yet colleges admitted 70% of graduates, which shows, by the way, also that as bad as colleges are, uh, it may be our primary and secondary schools are even worse. And those schools are mostly government-run monopolies, uh, more so than the colleges where greater real competition does exist. Now, the quest for knowledge requires that students hear and evaluate alternative perspectives on issues facing uh, uh, humanity. It means lively discussion and debate in an environment of free speech is critical for advancing civilization. Universities should be special places where free speech is celebrated, where ideas, even crazy, far-fetched ones, can be uttered and argued in an atmosphere of vigorous disagreement, but also one of respect. While the experience varies, at a large number of colleges, students, faculty, and outside visitors are prevented from expressing some ideas. Overwhelmingly, conservative or libertarian ideas are suppressed. Many studies show that an overwhelming majority of college professors in the social sciences and humanities are liberal. I actually once met a conservative sociologist and I was so surprised that I asked him for his autograph. Uh, but dominant leftist students and faculty aren't often content simply with hiring professors thinking the same as they do. They organize protests against distinguished scholars and leaders such as Condoleezza Rice or Heather MacDonald or Charles Murray, often effectively preventing them from speaking. They push for speech codes and so-called free speech zones, restricting to tiny areas on campus where individuals can speak their mind freely. They demand trigger warnings when a professor is going to say something that someone dislikes. They topple statues honoring Americans uh, our ancestors considered distinguished, believing erroneously, that somehow they, the students, are morally and intellectually superior to individuals who help make our nation great. Yes, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. Yes, he probably even impregnated one. But he also wrote the Declaration of Independence, a magnificent expression of the importance of the natural rights we all possess and and an extraordinary, outstanding, and courageous attack on tyranny and monarchical oppression. Let's turn to a third huge problem. We now have extremely low unemployment. The number of vacant jobs in America actually exceeds the number who are seeking work. So in a sense, we have a negative unemployment rate right now. We're ending the second decade of the 21st century. In the last month of the first decade, that is to say December 2009, exactly 10 years ago, the recorded unemployment rate in the United States was 9.9%. The black unemployment rate was 15.8%, almost triple the current rate of 5.5. Amidst all this current tightness in labor markets, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York reports that about 41% of recent college graduates are underemployed in jobs traditionally filled by individuals who have a lesser education, usually just a high school diploma. About 15% of recent graduates are either working in truly low paying jobs, perhaps as a waitress or a clerk in a big box retail store, or are, are completely unemployed. In 19... 70, the census told us that for every 150 person driving taxi cabs in America, one of them was a college graduate. By 2010, that had exploded. Now there are 25 out of every 150 taxi drivers are college grads. And the number is all going to be surely higher than the 2020 census and taken in a few months. Do you really need a college degree to drive a taxi cab? 
For years, we told high schoolers, you'll be a failure in life if you don't go to college, preferably a four-year school. For some, that was good advice, but for many, it was bad advice. Our nation needs good welders, plumbers, and computer coders. All jobs requiring some taught skills, but not a bachelor's degree. All these jobs pay very well. The holders of them are not faced with massive college debt. The college for all crowd has sold us a bunch of bull. Now, I've outlined some major problems facing higher ed, but my remarks don't call, uh, cover all of them. Let me, I'll just briefly mention a few more. Uh, the, I mentioned earlier there's been an explosion in the number of bureaucrats in American universities, pe people who don't teach nor do research. Mark Perry tells us that at the University of Michigan, there are nearly 100 diversity and inclusion officials, more than two dozen of which make over $100,000 a year. There's money in diversity. My guess is that if that number went to zero, there would be not be a resurgence of racial or gender discrimination against minority groups, and the U of M would save with free benefits maybe $14 million that could go for scholarship aid for deserving students or for general tuition uh, reduction of maybe 300 bucks a year. Not only are these administrators expensive, but they increasingly tell faculty how and what to teach. Welcome. This is just like my class back home. Students walk in whatever the hell they want. Uh, I'm glad to have you. Sorry. <laughs> Should have said that. Uh, uh, the faculty have been bribed by low teaching loads and decent pay into abdicating their responsibilities in universities. Intercollegiate athletics are a scandal. There's a widespread economic and occasionally even sexual exploitation of young persons. Academic values are subordinating to celebrating ball throwing exercises. I'm looking at Auburn here. Uh, uh, at, at uh, good school, actually. Uh, at wannabe aspiring athletic powers, students sometimes subsidize these ball throwing exercises annually more than a thousand dollars each, perhaps ten percent of the tuition level. My university loses over twenty million dollars a year on intercollegiate sports. Uh, there's been widespread ripoffs of students over food and housing on many campuses. The price of room, board, and textbooks has risen vastly faster than comparable prices in the real world outside of academia. Generally, resources are vastly underutilized. Classrooms and dormitories are empty for months each year, typically. A typical office at a Fortune 500 company probably gets used 1,500, 2,000 hours a year. In higher education, faculty members who are in their offices 500 hours a year are considered unusually diligent. I'm told I'm almost out of time. Uh, I do have tenure. You don't. Uh, I could talk about many other uh, uh, things, but let me show you one of the problems we have in higher ed. We need more of information, incentives, innovation. The problem is we lack these things. We don't even know how to measure success in higher ed. Uh, do the kids at Harvard learn more at school than those at American University, Emory, or the University of Nebraska? Who knows? Until recently, we couldn't say what history majors at Princeton made relative to sociology majors at Auburn University. And even now, the data are pretty inaccurate. We could use better information. I, in my uh, longer remarks, which apparently I'm not allowed to give, uh, I, I speak, huh? All right, I'll talk more. What I have to say is more interesting than the questions you'll ask me. <laughs> One thing we could do uh, to get very useful information is to have a college exit test, uh, an exam substituting for current accreditation, call it a college equivalence test, have it included, uh, have it on it uh, questions 
stuff from the critical learning assessment as well as the expansion of fact-based material included in the Intercollegiate Studies Institute study. The average scores as graduates of colleges receiving federal aid would be published. Schools whose average scores among graduates are exceptionally low would lose their accreditation. They're in accreditation. We no longer need uh, SACs and all these other nefarious organizations to do accreditation. Uh, you know, it's amazing. In the year two, uh, in the private sector, we have creative destruction. Remember Enron? Doesn't exist. 2000 is one of the top 10 companies. Eastman Kodak, market capitalization is less than mine. It exists, but it's on life support. It's gone through bankruptcy. They failed because it didn't keep up with the times. What happens to colleges? Has any college you know of any size ever failed? No. And because of that, colleges are complacent and they don't uh, deliver the goods. Now here's 15 ideas for reform. I'm not going to take a lot of time with these, but I'm going to sh uh, show them. The first thing that I would do, though, I've got to explain in some 30-second detail. Higher education in America is worse off because of the U.S. Department of Education. My four-point plan for the U.S. Department of Education is this. First, clear all human beings away from the department's D.C. headquarters. Second, have the United States Air Force use precision bombing techniques to destroy the building. Third, have the Army Corps of Engineers clear the debris. Fourth, have a respected organization advancing learning and understanding, perhaps the Smithsonian Institution located nearby, build an annex to the popular Air and Space Museum. Second, the federal government ought to exit the student lending business. President Trump is going to talk tomorrow to you with some changes in the student loan program, I believe. I think that's what he's going to do, from what I hear. Little birdie tells me. Uh, that's good. But we ought to be letting private entrepreneurs find other ways to funding college. There are many of them. If the federal student lo lending has encouraged colleges to pay fees, Retreating from it should promote fee reduction. Third, one innovative idea that should receive clear legal sanction is income share agreements where students sell equity in themselves, stock in themselves, a share of post-graduate earnings to private investors to help finance college. This shifts the risk of financing college to seasoned investors, gets government out of the business, allows financial aid to flow more freely to those whose contribution to society are likely to be the greatest. Four, if we're going to do away with federal loans, if doing away with them is politically infeasible, at least we should require colleges to have some skin in the game, share in the losses taxpayers incur when students default on loans. Fifth, make Pell Grants available only to poor students in the bottom quartile of the income distribution. Don't give the money to the college financial aid offices. Give it directly to the students. This should spur competition. Six, uh, non-degree forms of post-secondary education should share in any of the federal uh, funds uh, that are still distributed, such as modified Pell Grant. We ought to let kids go into coding academies get some federal support. Seventh, state government should give more money directly to students to finance attending their chosen college rather than to the universities. Money should go to consumers of services, not providers. This is similar to vouchers in K through 12. This should stimulate competition for students and again put pressure on universities to concentrate on job one educating students. Eight, I guess I lost some of these here, there you are. Eight, uh, suppression of free speech and peaceful forms of expression on campus should be discouraged. 
the presidential executive order on free speech, which was attended largely by Turning Point USA students, by the way, uh, should gain teeth by denying federal funds to schools systematically and continuously deny, uh, denying the right of free expression. I would not, however, let the federal government routinely monitor campus activities. Finding a way of nudging compliance with free speech is difficult. Ninth, uh, I don't want the federal government having an assistant secretary of education in charge of free speech who goes around to every campus and monitors speech activity. That'd be worse than what we have now. So, so it's a typical area to deal with. Ninth, some means of measuring general knowledge, uh, including uh, writing, mathematical literacy, critical thinking skills of graduate students would be desirable, such as a proposed college, a national college equivalence exam. Uh, tenth, remove tax deductions for donations promoting intercollegiate athletics. Create a commission of prestigious Americans to recommend fundamental changes in how college sports are conducted. Eleventh, it is possible for students to graduate from college in three years, not four. Very possible. That's what they do in Europe. Uh, uh, and you can do that by using more year-round uh, schooling. It would lower student costs, improve utilization of collegiate resources. Uh, high school students, uh, advanced placement, all similar. Twelfth, get rid of the complex FAFSA form, deterring many, especially, including low, especially low-income students, from even applying to financial aid. Now, President Trump yesterday signed a bill that allegedly will do this. It's the goal, we will see. I'm holding my breath. Thirteenth, while I generally do not like Washington telling colleges what to do, a rule saying that no federal aid could go to colleges or their students if the average undergraduate grade point average exceeds 3.0, the average, a rule like that would reverse grade inflation that removes incentives for students to study hard and make it difficult to distinguish, uh, that currently makes it difficult to distinguish superior students from ordinary ones. Fourteen, students are in the business of creating and disseminating knowledge. You should get out of other activities, such as serving as hotels and food providers and entertainment centers. They should probably increase out Outside provision of non-core activities, uh, outside provision of non-core activities like maintaining facilities. Uh, some of them run hospitals with medical schools. Maybe they should get out of the hospital business and make that a separate entity. Lastly, university governing boards are too often are rubber stamps for administration rather than important overseers of their activities. Governing boards should have regular access to information on university university activities that are not provided by the central administration that is inherently biased towards providing boards with an overly optimistic, non-objective reports on life on campus. Now this list is not uh, uh, exhaustive. I've wondered why state universities should have their, maybe we should put a tax on universities with excessive number of administrators, a head tax on university administrators. I, I think that might be kind of cool. Perhaps, yeah, good. I got one student in, on my side. Maybe we should force student affairs administrators who trample on due process by operating disciplinary proceedings similar to those of the Spanish Inquisition suffer some punishment. Maybe a week in a hotel room with Nancy Pelosi, for example. Yeah, they, they would like that. Put Mitch McConnell in with them, the, the dynamic trio. There are no end of reforms that could improve the system. I would start by largely getting the federal government out of higher education, but I would not stop there. Let me conclude by saying that adult Americans living today are violating one of their most uh, sacred human responsibilities caring for their children and grandchildren, and providing for their future well-being. They do this by tolerating governments that show no interest in the future, 
that promote trillion dollar budget deficits, that let adults use the educational system for their own selfish benefit rather than for nurturing the human capital of their progeny. Younger Americans appreciating the eternal values that made America work, hard work, thriftiness, honesty, kindness, compassion for the weak, but aspirations of strength. These are the hope and promise of America. And that these are the people we should nurture. You, in short. And I want you to do that. I hope you do that. So be boisterous. Be exuberant. Be effective. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? I've said some provocative things here, I, deliberately so. Yes, sir. Oh, we have a mic coming. Yeah. So you were saying that you wouldn't want anyone, uh, you know, executively regulating if they were following free speech. How would you propose going about deciding how they would be fined or what that, is a violation that needs fining? You are a clever young man. You asked the $64 question. Uh, where do you draw the line between what will nudge universities to do the right thing and what will be excessive interference with universities, on the other hand, and keep them from doing their job well? This is a new area. We've not got, we've never had problems with this at this level. So I'm not exactly sure. I would not create a bureaucracy. I might provide a means where people could sue universities uh, claiming that their speech has been abridged and collect significant damages if they are found uh, uh, successful in a court of law. That might be one way of dealing with it. There are others. It's a very good question. It's one that I admittedly, you know, we're it's uncharted territory. It, it, you want to clamp down on these ending a protest, but on the other hand, the people who protest have a right to to some expression of their views. So where do you draw the line? It's always a tough issue. It always is a tough issue. Um, could you just explain a little bit more why we should get rid of the FAFSA and what's so bad about it? Could you do that with one question? How much is your family's income? Or maybe two or three, I'll even go five questions. Do you have any other brothers and sisters in college at the same time? That obviously is a fact. Why 120? Now, President Trump, I read this in a noted uh, a source, the Drudge Report this morning, uh, that uh, signed a bill yesterday, apparently, that supposedly got rid of the FASCA form. Having said that, I sat in a meeting with the Secretary of Education in the year 2008, where she promised to do away with it. What happened? It went from 108 to 120. The, the, they're impossible to do. That's why I, I really think my solution that you applauded, I think this would be a great campaign line. You know, when they approved it, when they approved it, the, Dem the New York Times editorialized against that department when they went in. The Washington Post editorialized against it. Uh, the most prominent Democrat of the era, intellectual giant, Daniel Patrick Monaghan, said, we don't want it. We did it anyway. Why? Because the National Education Association wanted it. We should never have gotten into that business. Um, so how can we use like student government um, and get involved in like uh, student politics to maybe help bring down uh, the cost of education and kind of make our administrators more responsible? I've never. Uh, I'm a great believer in having student government. I'm never been too impressed with the success of it. But I do think this is one area where I tend to be a little radical. I kind of favor st students going on strike and uh, just not showing up for class. It wouldn't be a cool event if uh, a university uh, had applications for the next year's class and no one applied. Wouldn't that be something? Boy, the universities would reform like hell. Boy, would they change fast. 
Uh, I do think it, it's a complex question, and unfortunately, I don't have time to go into it. I'd love to talk to you privately about it, though. I, I, I think it is cool that students should be doing more than they are. I, I, I would agree with that general proposition. Time is up. I want to thank you.